Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 1, and this is session 41. And if I can just bring your memory back to where we were the last time, uh, we were looking at that pattern for edification that is found in every form of doctrine. And when we're talking about that, that means that every time you get taught, a, a, the Bible calls it a form of doctrine, and that's the reason I'm using that term. I think that's a, well, I said, <laughs> like, like the Bible chose to use a really good term. That kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? That is a, a very, <laughs> okay, I'm doing it again. It's a form of doctrine. That's what it is. And with every one of those, it's presented to us in three steps, and that is the godly thinking that we're supposed to have, and it's going to give us something in that form of doctrine that, that generates that kind of thinking. Sometimes it gives us the old way of thinking, and it says, don't think this, but think this. And then it describes that. So my, is that coming across too loud? And so then you have that, um, so you have that, that godly thinking, and then you'll have a section that covers godly living. And that talks about how to implement that new thinking into your, life, into your conduct and behavior. And then you come to the third uh, uh, component of this pattern for edifying, and that's the godly labor. And that is kind of where we left off last time, saying that God has a specific operation that He wants to get accomplished and that's going to be the critical difference between the godly living and the godly labor. In other words, uh, as part of your godly living, you may do something for your next door neighbor that helps them out in some way, but that's not necessarily godly labor. In other words, when God says there's an operation, there's, and when I say there's an operation, it means there's, there is something very specific that God wants to get accomplished. And so what He does is, and let me just kind of line this out, when we went to, from verses 3 through 8, we found out that this group should be looking at itself as a body. Remember? One body in Christ. And when we talked about those body attributes, and those body attributes were to be integrated into our living. And that, remember the thinking started out, for a man ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. There's the old way of thinking. But to think soberly. And then it describes what sober thinking is, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, that we've all been given this measure of faith or this responsibility to labor with our Father. And so because we all have a part in that, because we're all parts of a body, and you want all the members of your body to function so that that body really is doing not only everything it can do, but it's doing it the way that it's supposed to do it. So all of that thinking translated into a conduct, and we, and we located those four conducts, remember, a participate, cooperate, serve, and respond, that says that this body is going to live that way with each other. And then there was a particular labor that we were to perform, and I'm going to fill this one in because it's going to come up, and that was those offices. And just remember, and I, I, I should have put this body aspect up here, and I think I will, <clears throat> because these offices actually revealed themselves, manifested themselves in two particular ways or two particular groups. There is offices that were for the edification of the body. And we talked about those being filled by the static offices of pastor and deacon. But then the rest of the assembly is going to fall into a different category of offices. And they we just summed those up to call those the material needs offices. Now, I'm just not because I don't think you remember them, but I'm, again, we're going to do something with that. That first one was giving, and that second one was ruling, and that third one was mercy. And when we went through those offices, I gave you lots and lots of examples of the different ways that those offices could be filled within the framework of a local assembly. And so once those... <coughs> Once those offices got themselves up and running, and I'm talking about the edification needs offices as well as the material needs offices, once those all got functioning, and they not to say they are the only offices that we'll ever encounter, they're not. 
but they are the bare minimum to get the operation done. That, why is that the godly labor filling those offices? What operation is God trying to accomplish by means of the edification of material needs offices happening? Okay, selfless love, that's true. Okay, see, I'm, I'm asking you that question because if I'd done this right, you would have all jumped on this answer. So I didn't. So now I'm doing it right. And not that I did it wrong. It's just that, you know, I have these discussions with certain people from time to time. You know what my biggest problem in teaching is? I'm assuming that you understand things the way I automatically know it in my head. And so I make conclusions about stuff that you don't automa you're not automatically thinking about like I am. And you won't remember this, but back at Glen River Chapel, a friend of mine that lived out in Sanger, Texas, his wife had died, he got remarried. He was fixing to get remarried. He brought his fiance out. They sat in the service out there. I preached this wonderful sermon on a Sunday morning on the Antichrist. And I talked about Oh, man, I mean, it was, oh, boy, it was something. I mean, I put that thing together. I preached the sermon on the Antichrist. He came up after all. He said, man, that was really good. He said, I heard some things today I've never heard you talk about. And she came up, and she said this. Boy, that was really interesting, but who is the Antichrist? <laughs> See, I took for granted everybody knows who the Antichrist is and what the tribulation is. I never stopped to think that someone didn't know. All right, extreme example maybe, because most everybody did understand. But <clears throat> So here's my answer that I'm going to have to give you. Here's the operation that God is accomplishing by having these offices and these offices, these being the, the enumeration of them, in operation with every member participating somewhere in these offices. You are bringing this body into existence as a, as a real church. Do you remember me saying that if these offices aren't functioning, then God's not looking at you as a church. And it doesn't matter that you went down and incorporated with the state and you put your name on the sign out front and all of your stationery says such and such church. The truth is... If edification is not for, for the members of the assembly, and I'm talking about, what, what, et, what is edification unto? Edification unto godliness. That's, remember, when Paul talked to Timothy, he talked about, look, don't get involved with the genealogies and false ideas about this and that. He said, but focus on godly edifying. He told Timothy, that's your job. Don't get caught up on all this other stuff. Because, listen, at the end of the day, if you don't get edified, it doesn't matter what else you know. Because what is edifying? God, edification unto godliness. Remember, these are the three components to godliness. In other words, learning to think like your father, to do things his way, and to actually labor with him in his business. And if you don't get educated in that, it doesn't really matter. And you know what? And you can stand in front of God and go, I know a verse for every letter of the alphabet. But if you don't understand what those verses mean, that won't do you any good. Now, somebody that has been doing that their whole life is now angry with me because I denigrated their alphabet <laughs> verse. But look, you know what, you can, you, can, you can memorize five verses for every letter of the alphabet if you don't know how to rightly divide the word. It doesn't do you a bit of good. And, it, and even if you know how to rightly divide the word, if you're not understanding what those verses are telling you about how to think and how to live so that you can labor in a certain capacity, that doesn't do you any good. Are, are you with me there? And so I'm just, so what is the operation? The operation that these offices are creating is that you might actually come into being as a church for... Okay, let me just say this now. i got to move on. It, the church is one of the divine institutions. You know what a divine institution is? It means God is the creator of it. God is the creator of the divine institution of marriage. 
God is the creator of the divine institution of the church. God is the creator of the divine institution of government. He's the one that created those. And for each one of those he created, he has a purpose behind creating it. There was a reason for creating. There was something he was wanting to accomplish in all of that. And what is he wanting to accomplish now through making us understand that we're a body and that we have all of these offices and we're all supposed to participate like members of a body so that when you get up in the morning, your foot doesn't go, I ain't going. It, everybody cooperates and the body functions so that you really do now become a body, right? And so bringing that into existence, you don't really think you're a church just because you go, you're a church. What if you said, I'm a car? You know, we used to make jokes about that. You, you may live in the, in the garage. It doesn't make you a car. You see, you, it, you, it's got to be a genuine thing. And so as far as God's concerned, a church, what we read in Romans 12, 3, 3, is the minimum requirements for what it takes to be a church. And that brings it, or a body, in the sense that he's talking about it as a local assembly. So now, we, we're doing verses 9 and 10. We're almost through with it. I'm going to finish it here and move on into the next. But when you get to 9 and 10, let's read this first verse, and let me just show you. Let love be without dissimulation. There's the exhortation. Here's the godly thinking. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And we talked about what that was. That's the that's not just generally good and evil in the world. That was the good and the evil that happens to the other members of this assembly. Because right now, up to this point, this is very important for you to get. I'm not just giving you data here. For you to really understand what this passage in Romans 12 is saying to you, you have to understand there's a context for this. And that means the context of this whole thing so far has been the local assembly. That has been the context. And so when we get, because those words good and evil are very general in and of themselves, because of the context in which we find them, then we realize that our love, if it's not going to be with dissimulation, is now going to be characterized by another component. Ron mentioned the first one here. This is the selfless love that we're to have. And now in verses 9 and 10, you've got the thinking of, I hate, abhor means to hate. I hate it when something bad happens to Francis. And it doesn't matter what that bad is. If she's a part of this body, look, just think about her being a member of your body. If she's your hand and, and, and somebody stomps on it, you go, I hate that. But at the same time, if something good happens to her, you know what? A guy stopped her on the street and said that, you know, uh, an anonymous donor wants to give her a million bucks. We're not supposed... Okay, I don't need your hopes up. So, but, but you know what? If she comes in, she goes, I'm a millionaire. You know, you're not supposed to go, oh, good, Francis. Then you turn to your neighbor and go, why does that happen to her? She doesn't deserve that. You know what? We, when you cleave to something, you know what you do? You join yourself to it. In other words... You know what? It, we've seen this before. If one member suffers, what happens to the rest of the members? They suffer with it. If one member is honored, what do the other members do? They rejoice. And that's what that, that we're, just, we're seeing this here in Romans. Remember, you know where we saw that verse in Corinthians. It's not that you didn't get that in Romans. There it is. And so then he says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Here comes the godly living. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. And to get what that really meant, we define those words, kindly affection. And does anybody remember what the root of all that was? Kin. In other words, kind. Remember I gave you the old English word up here? And that word, the kind, came from how kin treated each other. And so when you, when, and, and, well, why kin are supposed to treat each other? Okay, because I know we all got the weird uncle. All right. So, hmm, I'm sorry. Can you pass this back? Thank you. All right. So, here's what we're, 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 so we have this being added to it now. 
kindness being added to it. And we found out that we don't just see each other as parts of a body. But it has to be more than that. Why? Because we can work together with other people for a common goal, but that doesn't mean we care about those other people. It just means we care about the goal. So now this is the other side of the coin. Yes, you're all part of a body, and you're all necessary, and you're all needful. See, it's not that we look at Lupia and we go, well, we just got to have him. Ha! <sighs> Well, okay, I'm just working toward the goal, so it doesn't matter if Loopy's here or not. See, no, instead you find out now there's another aspect of this, and there's a family aspect of this. And don't confuse this with being part of the family of God. That's what happened when you were justified. This is now talking about the relationship, the way you, listen, here it comes, value and esteem the other members of this group. That is how you have to begin to look at them and treat them. That was, we've been setting this up now for weeks. And if you think back to things that I've said before, you'll be, if you went back and listened to it, you'd be going, oh, you know what? You must have had that in mind when he was talking about it back there because here it is now. And you'd be right. And so we come down, and now we have this last labor here, and that's at the last phrase in this sentence, in honor, preferring one another. And so I'm just going to write the word preferring or prefer. In honor, preferring one another. And when we read that, that is a godly labor that is meant to accomplish another operation. What's the first operation? To bring this into existence as a body. Now, why is that? Okay, look. look I don't guess it does me any good to just spew this out if it's not making connections with you. Why in the world is that any kind of labor? Bringing us together as one body. Why is that even important? Why do we need to do that? Why didn't God just say, okay, you're one body. Go at it. Okay, and why did we need to recognize that? That's right. We need to recognize our relationship with each other so we can uh, uh, function as a single entity. And why does he have us do that? So that we never get to the point where we think of ourselves higher than we ought to think than anybody else. Because if you're all working in one unison towards one goal, whether it's low or higher, whatever position you have, if you're working within a body, you see the importance and you never... That whole pride issue that happened in the beginning never okay. takes off. And that's, that's, uh, and that's correct. Else else and that's correct, too. All of that's right. I want you to take this one step further. All of that's right. But there's something beyond that. Every, and see, I evidently, didn't, I, I'm assuming this, didn't do a good job of communicating this. So here it is. By the way, I'm going on the record. I'm telling you this time, okay? The, every godly labor, every godly labor translates, I don't know how to say this except with this phrase, one-to-one. -one. In other words, it has a direct translation with what we do here to bring this group of people who live in all kinds of different places with all kinds of personalities with all kinds of different backgrounds with all kinds of different understandings about all kinds of things in the world this do this form of doctrine brings that diverse group together into being one body in Christ and the reason it's important to discharge those offices to make that happen, see, I really thought you might answer your question this way. Because if, if, if people don't, if people don't, if they don't discharge the edification offices, then there's no real reason for us to get together unless we're just some kind of club. Or if, if we're not going to organize and do things in an organized way, then there's really, there's, you know, what are we going to get accomplished? You understand. I mean, if you do this within the setting of a normal church, here Bob pays the light bill. But you understand that in the normal setting, you know what people are doing is they're giving, they're giving money. You know what they're doing? Is they're paying the financial needs of the thing to keep it going. And, but, but people aren't just giving by giving money. How else are they giving? They're giving of their time and their energy toward other tasks that, 
It's the material needs of the assembly. In other words, these things need to be done in order for this to take place the way it's supposed to. But all of that goes beyond that. These offices allow us to come into existence as a body, and that operation, folks, is the training for when the entire body of Christ gets up in the creature, and now we've got to take this diverse group of people who have lived for the last almost 2,000 years, but have died as a member of the body of Christ, some of them knowing about being sons, and some of them never hearing it, and some of them hearing and rejecting it, and some of them only being simple sons, and some being fully educated sons, and some in between. We've got to take that whole group, and we've got to become one body up there that can function literally throughout a universe that, may I say this sincerely, is kind of big. We're going to occupy that thing as a single body. Do you know what it would be like if you just turned everybody loose to the four quarters of the, of the created universe and just said, okay, now look, I need y'all, I need y'all to, we're going to deliver the creature from the boundary corruption, so you folks out there in Alpha Centauri area, y'all need to make sure that you do that out there. Can you, if this thing's not really working as a body, and everybody's not in the place they're supposed to, do you understand what, you say, well, how are we going to know how to do that? This is what, this is training you to do. So when you say to yourself, Okay, I know, there's, I know a few things that we're going to do when we get up there, but I don't really understand how I'm going to know how to do that. The godly labors are all training you to do something that is going to be necessary for you to know when you get into the heavenly places. Does that make sense? That's the big difference between the godly living and the godly labor. So that you see, oh... I'm implementing this into my life, and now once I'm thinking right, and I'm living out of that new thinking, now the Lord comes along and says, now I want you to take that whole thing, and I want you to do something very specific with it, and when you do it, don't just think that this is busy work. Don't just think, oh, this is just my little way of making everybody feel like they've got a part. No. He's saying, in order for this group to really start functioning as one body, and to come into existence as a body... Both these, these, and these have to be taking place, and I need every member participating in, in those offices. And then once it's come into existence, he says, now I need, you've got the body part down, and now I need to give you another form of doctrine. And that next form of doctrine is in verses 9 and 10, and that's where you're going to no longer see each other as a body only, but now you're going to see each other as members of a family. And you're going to live in a way in which you are kindly affectioned one to another. And then and you say, now, so what is God going to do with that once we begin to get that into our living? In honor, preferring one another is the godly labor part of that. And that's the part that I really need to talk to you about. Because as I left off in that last session, I said, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, um, Wow. You know what, though? It's more important for you to get it, right? Is everybody understanding what I'm saying so far? Uh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I might as well stop. Th then this is a good place to stop because I have a minute and 15 seconds. So I'm going to stop this here. Don't go anywhere. We're going to start right back up, and we're going to go into session 42.